اهلا وسهلا بكم في اليوم الثالث على التوالي وخير الاعمال نهايتها نحاول ان نكون في الوقت اليوم تاخرنا بخمس دقائق لكن نحاول انه خلال الحصه الاولى نسترجع هالخمس دقائق هذه Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to have uh, this uh, discussion yesterday, either uh, in the plenary uh, session or in the different session about uh, the statistics and how we collect it, about data mining, about uh, how we take uh, uh, maximum benefits from this and, ha and how we uh, uh, help each other and how to cooperate in, in terms of collection of uh, data and uh, purifying uh, the data and giving the maximum information for our countries. So what we will, uh, we will continue today with uh, this uh, plenary uh, session, number six. So it's uh, also about uh, measuring uh, emergency uh, ICT trends. And uh, that's, uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Uh, Jin Keo Shen, Deputy Chef Engineering, China Academy of Information and Communication Technology in China. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> it's my honor to be invited here to be the moderator of uh, session six. Uh, as you know, uh, nowadays, the term of uh, AI, big data, IoT, and so many things, you, you know, so many new words are rising very quickly. It, but it is very uh, uh, different uh, in uh, various countries, in various countries. So uh, as you know, uh, with the introducement of the new technology and the new services in daily life and in the industry, we can observe the fast development of the, uh, of the ICT sectors, which may, uh, you know, you can take a look at the uh, new uh, devices, new services, such as e-commerce, such as uh, mobile payment, such as uh, uh, digital content services everywhere in the home or in the office. So uh, we are very happy to, to be here to discuss the hot topics, what's going on in different countries, what's the emerging trend for, the, uh, for this new uh, emerging uh, technologies when we, uh, we are ready to, uh, when we are ready to uh, uh, judge its influence or its uh, uh, inside millions, for, particularly for the developing countries. So uh, we have, uh, four panelists here, invited four panelists here to discuss these hot topics. Uh, they are, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, them to you. <clears throat> Number one is Professor Jonas Bohr, uh, who is, uh, is also the uh, moderator of uh, yesterday morning's uh, session three. He is a department of uh, a chair of department of media and information, Michigan State University, and associate editor of Ted Communication Policy. Number two is uh, Miss May Emma. She is head of Carol Operations and a senior data engineer. Number three is uh, Dr. Nicholas Federick. He is postdoctoral researcher coming from Oxford Internet Institute of University of Oxford. Number four is Mr. Joe Nolunka. He is head of the Statistics and Market Research, Anacom from Portugal. He is also just, uh, he was uh, appointed the new chair, chair of uh, EGTI. Congratulations on you. <coughs> we hope to uh, work with you in the coming uh, uh, recycle, coming recycle. So um, nowadays, uh, now it's a turn. I will first invite Professor Jonas Burr to give his keynote speech. So the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Mr. Chairman, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here this morning and to continue some of the discussion that we started yesterday. I would like to make three points this morning that transforming emerging technologies into economic and social opportunities requires three things. We need to document the new ICT value chain much better than we currently do. We need to inform policy and governance in new ways. And thirdly, in order to do so, we need to develop new ICT indicators. Let me talk to each of these three points briefly. We already heard yesterday about four digital transformations that are currently affecting our lives and our work. The Internet of Things, big data, analytics, I would like to add, new computing architecture such as cloud computing, and artificial intelligence. These technologies are pervasive and embedded in all aspects of our life and will become even more so in the future. They have tremendous opportunities to advance the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but they also pose enormous new challenges for governance and business decision makers. Of the four, currently the Internet of Things is the largest, as you see in the, in the diagram on the, on the right-hand side. Artificial intelligence is the smallest, but artificial intelligence most likely in the 10-year period between 2015 and 2025 will grow fastest almost 5,700% during the time period, whereas the others we expect will grow at about the rate of 300%. It is important, and I'd like to come back to something that Lourdes Montenegro said yesterday already, uh, briefly, to understand the technological and economic forces that are driving these transformations. Some of those are beyond our control. They are how technology evolves. Uh, you may have heard about Moore's law on the quotation marks. It's a regularity uh, about the, the improvement of efficiency in semiconductors, which leads to essentially half uh, of the costs uh, will be shaved off every, every 18 months approximately. But there are others in place. Cooper's law does the same thing for wireless communication services. So we see in all these technologies tremendous performance improvements that translate into cost uh, decreases therefore enable ever more ubiquitous connectivity at uh, faster and faster space, speeds, uh, enable massive growth uh, of user and machine-based data collection, and essentially force businesses to really completely rethink what they're doing. The this, this slogan here is, the keyword is that many businesses need to start become, to become platform businesses rather than pipeline businesses. It's a very different logic of doing business where we can accelerate value generation by building networks, ecosystems uh, of partners. The four technologies are essentially enabling technologies. And they enable innovations, many of which we don't know yet. So it is important to create a framework that is not constraining for entrepreneurial activity. Without going into details, let me just give you a couple of examples. The Internet of Things commonly looked at as the next generation of the internet. We'll extend our communications capabilities to devices uh, to create cyber physical systems that will enable us to achieve great improvements, let's say in agriculture, in health monitoring, in energy systems, in transportation systems. Big data analytics essentially is necessary to help us understand and make sense of the vast amount of data. So it is a complementary technology to, to the internet of things uh, to a large degree. Again, enormous improvements in transportation, energy, and services industries. Cloud computing, again, complements these other technologies in that it makes us independent of time and space in terms of accessing these services. Lastly, artificial intelligence, the, the smallest currently but fastest growing technology, uses machine learning to assist humans in making better decisions and also to make routine decisions that we could delegate to machines and, and robots. We already have enormous advances in diagnostics where artificial intelligence, for example, regularly outpaces the skill of diagnosticians uh, in predictive maintenance of plant, of engines, aircraft engines, and so forth. 
We do not, however, have a general purpose artificial intelligence yet. We made huge progresses, but we don't have a general purpose artificial intelligence technology, which limits the ability to situations where we have large amounts of data on which we can train our machines to make such choices. But I think over time, we'll relieve those constraints as well. Now, it is important to understand that these enabling technologies completely change how value is generated in the ICT industries. On the left-hand side, you see the old stovepipe model of how value was generated. As a regulator, this was a very, very easy time to do your job. It was easy to, to use those performance improvements and really create more efficient and better services all the time. In the new system, though, what we have is a highly interdependent ecosystem of players. Many of them are not regulated, and one of the challenges for creating a reliable and forward-looking indicator system is how to get the data from companies that are essentially beyond the control of many of government uh, activities currently. This ecosystem works as a fast-paced digital innovation system. Those of you who, who, who may know some of the American literature may have heard of Alice in Wonderland. In Alice in Wonderland, there's uh, a scene where there's a red queen that says, in order to stay in place in this country, you have to move ever and ever faster. Game theorists took this up. Currently, what we see in these technologies is a red queen effect, a technology race where connectivity, application services, and then now the Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, each are related in a virtual cycle. But whether that virtual cycle can be optimized and we can harness the benefits for society will to a large degree depend on the center, policy and governance. How do we uh, enable these technologies to work? So let me now briefly look at what the implications are and what we need to know uh, to inform policy and governance. The first thing I would like to emphasize here is that ICTs are neither good nor bad. I know this is a risky proposition in an audience that inherently believes in the benefits of technology, but I would like to warn you whether we can utilize those benefits depends highly on the social, the political conditions in which these technologies are enabled to unfold. We do not know, and a second point I would like to emphasize, the full effects of these digital transformations. We have very, very fantastic visions of how the future could be, but we also have dismal visions as to how it might end up in ways that we don't like. So ICTs, despite bringing huge benefits for the social de uh, development goals, might also bring challenges such as unemployment. Robotics, artificial intelligence uh, can replace human labor very, very easily. We have already discussed next generation digital divides, where the great advances that were made over the past three decades in bringing many of the lower and middle income countries to better infrastructures might actually be jeopardized because now the race moves to those next generations of technologies. Lastly, technologies of freedom, such as mobile communications, the internet, could also be technologies of surveillance and control. And we do not want them to be abused in this way. To protect society, we need sufficiently intelligent and smart policy models uh, to, to control these technologies and to shape these technologies in ways that they benefit society. The main thing, the third point I would like to make here is that there is not one single best model. You all come from countries at different income level, at different infrastructure deployment levels, and the best policy needs to be appropriate and customized to those conditions. This is something I think that is different from what we thought 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that there's one best model how we should do things. So this is encouraging because these technologies provide the flexibility to, to correspond to them and to respond to them in unique, nationally appropriate models. There will be probably three or four or five uh, types across uh, the globe, but appropriate models will differ from country to country. The good thing is that many of the tasks and many of the accomplishments that were achieved in the past decades go in the right direction. Because to have efficient network infrastructure and the deployment of services in place is a very important precondition. But there are additional things that are needed by policy, and those might challenge ICT regulators and policymakers because you're historically perhaps not used 
to work with other policymakers in education, in economics ministry, and so forth. So we need complementary user skills. This is not just education in computer science or in data analytics or to have a digital literary workforce. These are important, but we also need a, a new digital mindset that enables business people to, to work as platforms and that enables individuals to take advantage of the great opportunities of software. One of the great pluses of these digital transformations is that they become easily usable. But we need the right mindset to use them. Big data analytics, as we will see in a moment, offer so many new opportunities that can be done uh, by many, many people if they have the right mindset to work with the data and ask the right questions. Lastly, we need policy responses that enable entrepreneurship. This is a big challenge for many regulators because regulation has historically been construed as a constraining force. Regulation initially, initially started as limiting monopoly power and market power. And to make that mind change from limiting the abuse of market power to enabling entrepreneurship and innovation is a big change that needs to be made. Lastly, let me say a few things about how we can create a system of indicators that will inform those important issues. Again, I would like to make a couple of very important points without really going into detail. I think we can only use, and the experience shows this, these technologies to the best of society if we use what is called human-centered design approaches. We have to start our analysis from the effects on individuals, on humans and organizations that these technologies exert, and then work backwards to understand how we can best harness them. Um, doing this requires continuously updated and reliable information. And we can, of course, do this as governments that collect data, and this is a very important part, but we can also trust, as was already discussed yesterday, machine-generated uh, collection of data and, and of data processing. Now, what's the role of the public sector in this, in this new, more diverse framework? I think there's three important ones, in addition to be a, a, a collector of information. First of all, we need to come up with new frameworks to, to collect standardized information that is of broad importance. This is information such as, as the indicators that are collected by the ITU and others that everybody needs to know and everybody needs to have. But that cannot be all. I think we need also to rely on machine learning, uh, the collection of data from the networks through open algorithms and open data. Not all of this data is necessarily needed for everybody. Uh, so we have to make crucial decisions what's the accessibility of this data to help us make our decisions. Lastly, I think there's a very important role of the public sector to be a curator and an archiver of data, uh, a facilitator of data generation rather than the data collector itself, through open repositories and others. We need, in order to achieve these goals, indicators, but we also need better ways to model and understand what is happening. And here, the most important thing is, again, to focus on what's the goal. Indicators are not just indicators uh, by themselves, but they are indicators to help us achieve certain purposes such as this, um, the Sustainable Development Goals or other economic and social goals. So that's the starting point. Then we have to f ask ourselves, how can we create frameworks that help us better inform decisions that lead to those goals? And there's certain steps that we need to undertake to develop such an enhanced system uh, of indicators. One is we need to create better direct indicators of those emerging technologies. One challenge there is that these technologies are embedded Artificial intelligence is widely diffused. Big data analytics is widely diffused. It's difficult to count devices like within in the number of access lines. So we have to come up with new ways of measuring that could include, in addition to the number of devices where this is feasible, what's the percentage of the installed base, let's say, in businesses, in government offices that uses uh, uh, technologies with certain capabilities? What's the, the share of revenues that is uh, accrued uh, with these activities? Secondly, we need to have additional information on basic services and software, such as M2M connectivity, uh, the availability of big data analysis software. And lastly, we have to augment our indicators with new indicators on the applications and services sites, such as what's the percentage of businesses that use cloud solutions or artificial intelligence. 
In addition, though, to these emerging technology indicators, we need to better understand the enabling conditions and where we are with regard to meeting those enabling conditions. So we need data on network infrastructure. Again, this is already collected, so nothing new here. But we need better data on skills. We need also uh, better data on policy arrangements. For example, what's the number uh, of, um, what's, how many cities do have open data policies? How many government agencies do have open data policies? What's the share of unlicensed spectrum? Indicators like this. Lastly, we also need to have better understanding of our outcomes. How are these technologies related, for example, to income? How are they related to unemployment and equality? These are issues that go beyond the immediate remit of our telecommunications regulators and telecommunications policymakers. Therefore, you need to work with others. Last but not least, let me, let me mention that one illusion needs to be eliminated, and that is that big data speaks in and of itself. It does not. In order to make sense of the data, we need explanatory models, we need predictive models, and most importantly, to help decision making, we need prescriptive models that help our decision making. Now, I know that you cannot read this, but I encourage you, this is a table that is taken from the new report that provides a matrix of these indicators that we can use uh, to substantiate these information requirements. In many, many cases, this is information that is already captured, that is already in the indicators that exist, so we need to augment them uh, with those that we, we need for the future. So let me conclude with two recommendations specifically. One is short term. In the short term, I think it is important to build on existing initiatives such as EGTI, the Partnership on ICT for Development, to develop an enhanced system of indicators that enables us to document better uh, those four emerging technologies. In the medium term, though, and I was tempted to say in the long term, and then I realized there is no long term in these fast-paced technologies. It's the medium term is, is relevant here. In the medium, I encourage you to, to think boldly and develop a new system of digital national accounts along the lines of that matrix that I just showed you that enables us to fully comprehend the pervasive and massive impacts of these emerging technologies and make better technologies going forward. It's very exciting to be in this field those days. You might think it is daunting, the challenges are so big, but it's exciting. These are enormous opportunities that occur only once in a lifetime. And I think we, we are here and we're starting a process here to harness those. And in order to do so as successfully, I always say you need two things. You need hard heads, because you really need to think through these complicated dynamic issues with a clear analytical framework. And you need soft hearts, because without soft hearts, you will not have the compassion that will help us realize the enormous benefits of these technologies. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Bohr. You have given us a very uh, uh, influential, uh, you know, uh, and uh, thoughtful uh, idea and judgment. Uh, but I think may, many of the uh, many uh, participants will have will be interested on in your recommendation and proposal. But you know, we we are a little bit later, so we have to <laughs> speed up the the, uh, the coming uh, process. So I, I will uh, invite. The second speaker from uh, coming from the Activa, Ms. Amo, to give your speech. So the floor is yours. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. Beyond artificial intelligence. Over the years and since the 50s, it's been, it has always been the ultimate goal of computer engineers and scientists to develop machines that can model the complex decision-making process that a human brain can naturally do. Hence, it's no wonder that scientists were inspired by the brain and its neurons as the most advanced computational organ in the natural world. Scientists were successful building complex artificial neural networks that have massive computational capabilities. Integrating those networks with other uh, computer technologies like computer vision help machines to understand their surrounding environment, make decisions, and take actions. And now, we're living in a world surrounded by those hyper-connected devices, devices that have massive cognitive abilities. 
Most of these devices are very smart making decisions, yet these decisions are very transactional. They go linear in one direction. Devices that have very high IQ, but no EQ. It's turning into a world that's devoid of emotions. And here comes our team's bold vision. We imagine that in the next five years, devices will be emotionally aware. We need to bring empathy into the way we connect to devices and back into our lives. Devices will be able to read and sense your emotions and respond back accordingly, just the way an emotionally intelligent friend would. From here, let me give you more background about, about my organization. Affectiva was spun out of the MIT Media Lab in 2009. It was co-founded by two leaders in the field of affective computing, Dr. Rosaline Picard, the publisher of the affective computing book, and Dr. Ronald Kalyubi, who is our current CEO. And I can tell you that Affectiva is a leading pioneer in emotion AI. By why, but why emotions? Why emotion AI in particular? Emotions influence every aspect of our lives from our health and well-being, how we connect and communicate with one another, the purchases that we do, how we do businesses, every decision we make, big ones and small ones. Yet, being surrounded by all these, by all these devices, we are now spending more time connecting to these, to these devices and through these devices, more than we connect and communicate with one another. I think most of us can relate calculating the number of times we, sp we spent with our laptops and with our smartphones. How many of you have watched the movies Ex Machina and Her? <laughs> Good. What's fascinating about these movies that machines featured were not just super, super smart, but they were highly emotional intelligent. And because of, because of that, they were able to get the, like, the guys in the movies to like them, persuade them, and motivate them to take actions they wouldn't have taken otherwise. Of course, the movies took darker turns that we will forget about for now, but it's been shown over and over that humans that have high emotional intelligence are more likely to succeed in their lives, are more likely to get liked by others. And interestingly, this translates to how we connect to machines. Imagine a world that doctors can ob objectively measure your emotional state just the way they measure other vital signals. So when you step into a doctor's office, they don't ask you, what's your blood pressure? They just measure it. What the golden rule in mental health is filling out surveys. What if we can detect early depression and Parkinson behaviors, avoiding more suicides? What if your car can sense that you're angry and frustrated and makes your brakes more responsive? These questions and many more in different domains drive our team in Affectiva to build technologies that can read and respond back to your emotions. And the starting point was the face. The face happens to be one of the most powerful signals that we all use in our daily communication. Everything from frustration, confusion, uh, curiosity and yeah, different, different emotions. It contributes by 55%, while 38% is how you say the words, and only 7% are the actual words. So when you're texting, only 7% of all your emotional and social states are communicating, while the rest are just lost in the cyberspace. Facial signs have started over 200 years ago by this guy called the Shin, who used to electrically stimuli people's facial muscles in order to study their movements. This is very painful and we don't do that anymore. We use computer vision and machine learning. Fast forward 100 years later came in Paul Ekman and his team, who started gi giving each facial muscle movement an action unit name. So for example, action unit 12 is when you put your lip corners to the side. It's a contributor of a smile. Let's try it around everyone, spreading more smiles. And it's an indicator of, of an, a positive emotion, while AU4 is when you draw your brows together, forming all those textures and wrinklers. Is a very, is a, we don't like this action because it's a huge indicator of a negative emotion. We have 45 of these action units, and they combine in different ways to form different 
emotions. Yet, teaching a machine to learn the difference between these action units is not an easy task because these actions can be very subtle, they can happen very fast, and they combine in many different ways. Take, for example, the smile and a smirk. They look somehow similar, but they mean totally different things. A smile is positive, while a smirk is often negative. And it is important for a machine to learn to detect the difference between them. So how do we do that? A machine is like a student. It needs to be provided by examples so that it can learn about the, sub about the, the, the subject it needs to learn about. So we provide our, our networks by thousands thousand and thousands of examples of people who we know are smiling, people with different face shapes, different ethnicities, genders, different age groups. And we do the same for, for smirks. We pass, those, we pass those examples into deep neural networks and using deep learning te techniques. The, the networks are, are capable of extracting the differentiator feature between a smile and a smirk. And it will learn that all smiles have common characteristics, while all smirks have subtly common different characteristics. So the next time it sees a new face, it's like a student sitting in an exam. It will, it will if, if the student is well studied well, like a machine being provided by unbiased examples, uh, 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 enough examples, it will, it will learn to detect if the face is smiling, smirking, or d doing any different actions. Now we have classifiers that can detect 23 of these action units, seven emotions, and three appearance matrices, gender, ethnicity, and age. We've just added speech into the mix. It's just a couple of months old now, and we can map your, how you say the words to an emotional state, extracting features like tempo, pitch, energy, and mapping all those features into different emotional states. Now we have four matrices for speech, arousal, laughter, uh, anger, and, and gender. Till now, we have amassed 60 billion emotion data point. It's the world's largest emotion database. Uh, the, the data points are collected from 6 million faces analyzed in 87 countries. It is very important to have this spontaneous type of data. And most, so most of our data is spontaneous collected in the wild. Lots of ethical questions revolve around data collection, but in short, affective as one of Affectiva's core, core values is to maintain the privacy of, of people. So we, we don't record or analyze people's facial expressions unless they opt in and agree to share their data. The diversity of the data that we collect allow our algorithms to, to work and detect people's facial expressions from all around the world. It's not just about the diversity of the data that we collect, it's about the diversity of the team. We have two, Affectiva consists of two team members, uh, uh, sorry, two, team, uh, two teams in Boston and in Cairo, where I come from, with, with members from um, more than 10 countries, Bangladesh, Netherlands, Iran, uh, Taiwan, Canada, different parts of the US and Egypt, and, and many more. Mindful that a diverse team is more capable of building diverse technology. Diversity breathes creativity. It's mind-blowing the number of domains that emotion AI can be integrated in, quantifying something as personal as facial expressions and emotions. Let's take a couple of examples in different applications in the health domain and uh, education. In education, the MIT Media Lab has integrated Affectiva's SDK in Tega. Tega is a social robot platform that supports educational interaction with children. There was an experiment conducted with children learning Spanish as a, learning, uh, as a second language. Uh, and, and the group of children was divided into two groups. One group 
uh, worked with Tega and the other didn't. The group who worked with Tega was, was shown that, that they learned more words in shorter duration because Tega was able to read the emotional state of students, everything from their confusion level, boredom, frustration, and it adapted the content accordingly. While in the health, well, in the health spectrum, brain power um, partnered with Affectiva, building the world-first augmented reality smart glasses system, empowering patients in the autistic spectrum to understand the emotions of people that they are communicating with them, uh, and teach themselves to um, more cognitive and social uh, uh, skills. The merger of IQ and EQ in tech nowadays is inevitable. Emotion AI has the potential of democratizing the access to services like education and, and healthcare. Closing the gap of the socioeconomic state, but this will not happen unless we as leaders in the space of AI ensure that the technology is being used in the right direction. So from here I'd like to call policymakers in different countries to prioritize the development of AI and increase the circle of machine learning scientists and applied AI developers in the regions. From our side, it's our goal to emotion aware every device in the Internet of Things by providing an emotion chip that will track your mood throughout the day and give you personalized recommendation by the end. There is a lot of stuff to be done in the emotion AI field, and that's why we have packaged the technology into a free SDK that, that's support by, supported by different platforms, so that developers from all around the world can download the SDK integrated in different fields, different domains, and the sky is the limit. Emotion AI will not just transform how we connect with devices, but how we connect and communicate with one another. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. May. You have given us a very uh, interesting uh, presentation of the emotion AI, what is applied in the daily life. It is not only, I totally uh, agree with you, it's not, the, uh, it's not the device by itself, but it, it's widely used in the field of the uh, daily life and, uh, and our office work. So it's so many, it can be applied in everywhere. So we, we can uh, discuss the uh, topics uh, 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 a little time later. So now let me invite the third speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas Fiedrich from Oxford University to give his speech. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I want to spend the short time that I have to alert you to some stark divides in the global digital economy, which I think have important implications for the topic of this session. To do that, I will use studies by my colleagues at the Oxford Internet Institute, often focusing on Africa. And these studies highlight, in particular, the extreme geographical divides in digital production. With the United States and Europe dominating, and no signs of low-income countries closing the gap. Uh, divides in digital production are not often acknowledged because we tend to focus our attention on adoption. This year, 2017, I'm sure you're all aware, is the historic year in which half of the world's population uh, is going to be online. This map, even if, if it is from 2013, helps visualize that there are now many more, far more internet users in the so-called developing world uh, compared to the developed world. However, adoption and other indicators of usage are not at all good measures of digital divides. They're not comprehensive. 100% um, of people are using the internet as inherently the maximum that any country can reach. So for adoption, since the North has widely reached saturation, catching up of the global South is almost a foregone conclusion, at least if we assume decreasing cost. But when we shift our gaze uh, to digital production, we see a drastically different picture. 
Let's start with user-generated content. This map shows you that in 2013, the number of Wikipedia articles about Central, Western, and Southern Europe was greater than the number of articles about the entire rest of the world. In fact, not only do we see drastically more content creation in the global north, the north also dominates the south in content creation about the south. This map shows this again with Wikipedia edits this time. There is obviously a language barrier from people from non-English speaking countries to contribute to online content about their uh, home regions, but the stronger cause, as you see here, uh, for the lack of participation is the nation's income level and connectivity history. You can see here, for example, that many, African, uh, that many African countries contribute barely at all to the English language information that is available about them. Next, what happens if we define digital production more narrowly? Uh, the data paints a similar picture, one of stark divides between the North and the South. In this more recent study, we used data from GitHub, which is the world's largest uh, repository of code, and a database of website domain registrations. We then chose academic articles as a comparator, um, so this measures traditional knowledge creation. Academic articles we thought were interesting because they are notorious for being extremely skewed towards the global north and to English-speaking hubs like the US and the UK. So this study showed that even when taking a comparator like academic knowledge production, which is already extremely skewed, digital production is actually even more skewed uh, in favor of the global north. Um, so you see here in these, in these charts that the global north uh, accounts for about 80% of digital production measured according to these two uh, uh, measures, while, they, while uh, uh, Europe and, and the US actually only have 20% of the, of the population. So we see this 80-20 divide. In particular, you see the jump for North America, obviously with the, due to the US, uh, jump upwards, and Asia and the MENA region uh, lose. Digging deeper into this uh, and going to the country level, we then start to see clearly the absolute dominance of the United States. Here we're again using GitHub data. Uh, this graph shows uh, the export-import ratio of followers on the GitHub network. So this is a kind of um, trade surplus of software developer influence. There are a lot of interesting aspects to this, to this measure, which I won't have time to, to discuss here, but the clear message is that the US has a very particular role as a global influencer, with almost 2.7 times as many follows from the outside of the US uh, into the US than from uh, within the US to the rest of the world. We did a similar analysis that I'm not showing here with data on Stack Overflow, uh, which is an online forum for software developers, and the results were basically uh, the same. We can also see from this GitHub uh, follower data set that there's very little South-South exchange. For every African region, we looked at African regions here, for every African region, about a fourth of followers uh, goes to the US, a much smaller but still a significant uh, percentage goes to, goes to Europe, and only tiny fractions go to Asia, Oceania, or the Middle East. We also see that only North and Southern Africa um, have significant intra-regional followership, uh, likely because they have larger economies and more established uh, tech industries to begin with. In East, West, and Central Africa, um, software developers almost exclusively follow others outside of their home region. And here's the result of that um, in economic terms. At one point in 2016, the five largest uh, companies in the world were the five global uh, digital technology companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. At that point, their combined valuation was equivalent um, to the nominal GDP of the entire African continent. Um, at the time, investors felt that Google alone was worth as much as the GDP of Nigeria. For the time being, this trend is only increasing. In 2017, none of these companies uh, have decreased uh, in value. Two Chinese contenders have, have entered the fray, Alibaba and Tencent. But digital, digital companies from uh, countries other than China and the US are nowhere to be found. Now, I'm aware that company valuation is not an entirely meaningful metric uh, for development, and that this is, of course, only a snapshot of the absolute top end of the global digital economy. But this does illustrate to me that the value that is being created through the enormous growth of the global digital economy is captured only in a very narrow subset of places, specifically Silicon Valley in the US, a few places in Europe, and a few places in, in East Asia. So where do we go from here? Where does this uh, picture leave us? Let me revert my somewhat pessimistic uh, talk a little bit and tell you that there is hope. 
Um, I based this statement on information uh, which is not well quantified, which we have so far not been able to quantify in any meaningful way. But from our extensive qualitative work, uh, we do know that a lot of technological innovation is happening uh, across the African continent. Again, I'm taking the African continent because that's the focus of our, of our research. And that this has important uh, de positive development impact. So this new economic practice, digital entrepreneurship, as we've come to call it, is unlikely to have vast development effects in the short term or in the midterm, but it does have important long-term potential. And this is because it's one of the very few ways for developing countries to, con to control their own technological destiny. It's not about protectionism, but it's about creating the conditions in education and training in the integration of markets to enable local enterprises to adapt global ICT trends in ways that work locally for them to grow in scale, uh, but also for them to create new pathways of innovation that positively impact lives regardless of the financial bottom line. The key is that digital entrepreneurship can be a way to create and capture value locally. So let me close by highlighting the implication uh, of this for you, for this, for this audience. I'm calling upon you, but also upon us as, as, as researchers, um, to measure digital production and digital entrepreneurship specifically much more carefully than we've, than we've done so far. And I'm aware that this is a challenging task, but I'm happy to explore this challenge with you now in the Q&A session or afterwards. Thank you very much. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, uh, you have just given us a, a very detail about the digital divide. And the, you know we have to do something to bridge the digital divide. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, you can easily find the, uh, the new kinds of uh, digital divide, uh, particularly in the field of the new emerging technologies. So I, I think may, many of our uh, uh, participants will have interest uh, on the discussion how we can uh, do something, particularly for the regulators and the ministries. And uh, you, are all, you also touch on the topics of the digital skill digital skills is not only related to the industry, but also to the, uh, you know, to the digital skill of the uh, human, uh, of the people. So we will invite the last speaker of our session, uh, the new chair of the EGTI from the uh, Portugal Anacom, Mr. Joe Norman. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, my presentation is on measuring the Internet of Things. Uh, I will start by trying to define what is the Internet of Things. Uh, the Internet of Things is a network of interconnect interconnected things or devices. Most of them are connected to the, to the Internet and use standard communication protocols. They have certain capabilities. They are sensors or actuators, or they are ab able to be programmed. And uh, they generate lar a large volume of information. These uh, devices and information can then be packaged into services. Uh, in practice, what this means is that we'll have billions of devices that are interconnected and will generate big data and will cover all areas of activity. For instance, we'll have uh, connected homes, smart farming, industry 4.0, uh, smart cities, connected health, smart retail, etc. Some people are calling the IoT the new electricity. Uh, and uh, because of its relevance for uh, our lives and our societies, the public policy and regulation must take the IoT into account. Uh, Professor Bauer uh, already explained more detail, in a more detailed way why this is important. Uh, at this stage, I would only like to say that uh, telecoms will be the infrastructure of the IoT. And so 
public policy makers and regulators must make sure that telecoms does not become a bottleneck or a barrier to the de development of uh, the IoT. So issues like standardization, interoperability, numbering, addressing, and also coverage, accessibility, availability, universality, all these issues must be taken uh, care of and uh, by, by regulators and policymakers. On the other hand, the telecom sector itself is being transformed. Uh, and so for regulators, market analysis becomes more difficult. Uh, Professor Bowers stated that life for regulators was much easier before. And in fact, when I started working, we had about four or five operators and three services. And uh, now we don't even know how many operators we have and or where they are. So life is more difficult. We have tight oligopolies. We, we have our operators entering other markets and other entities entering uh, telecom markets. Uh, some operators are based on other countries, so it, it's difficult to enforce national laws. And there are new issues like net neutrality, for instance. So in order to address all these issues, uh, it makes sense to start collecting data on IoT. What kind of data should we uh, collect? Uh, Okay, in the, in, in the short term, I think there are two sets of data that are uh, relevant, coverage and uh, usage. Concerning coverage, uh, well, we have to collect data on mobile coverage, uh, since mo a lot of uh, IoT applications will be based on uh, mobile networks. Uh, the good news is we are already collecting data on uh, mobile coverage for 2G, uh, 3G, 4G, and uh, there are international groups that are at the moment studying uh, how to measure 5G um, coverage. Then there are other areas of the IoT like LPWA. Uh, LPWA stands for low power, low power wide area applications. We must, make, must determine if it's feasible or necessary to collect data on LPWA. We must also collect data on fixed coverage because Fixed coverage is important to the, to, the, uh, to the Internet of Things. First of all, 90% of wireless traffic is supported by fixed networks, and even 60% of mobile traffic is offloaded onto fixed networks. And then we have a large share of the Internet of Things, which are the short-range applications, which are supported on fixed networks. So it is important to collect data on fixed coverage. Uh, the good news is we are already collecting data on fixed coverage. Uh, regulators, ministries, and uh, the, the ITU, for instance, are starting to collect data on fixed coverage. There are also other infrastructures that are associated with the Internet of Things, for instance, Internet exchange points, data centers, cloud. We should also study if it makes sense, if it's possible to collect data on these uh, infrastructures. Then we have the issue of usage. Uh, and in order to determine exactly what we're talking about, it makes sense to, to see what kind of applications the IoT covers. We have basically three uh, groups of uh, IoT applications. We, we have wide area critical applications, which require ultra reliability, availability, low latency, and high data throughput. An example of this is, of course, autonomous or self-driving cars. Then we'll have wide area non-critical applications that require high connection volumes, low traffic, low energy consumption, and low uh, cost devices. And uh, an example of this is fleet management. And then we'll have the short range applications. Uh, this will typically involve connections with a, a range of 100 meters or less. And uh, some smart home applications will be short range applications. Now. These IoT applications are supported by networks. Uh, for instance, wide area critical applications may be supported by 4G and 5G networks. Uh, wide area non-critical applications will be supported by other cellular technologies and also by the LPA, LPWA proprietary uh, technologies. And then the short range applications will uh, be supported by wireless and fixed networks. Some of, these techno some of these networks also support uh, uh, other types of applications. What are the data sources for all these uh, 
applications and networks. Well, for cellular ap uh, applications, for cellular networks, we can rely on supply side indi uh, indicators and uh, our, let's say, traditional data suppliers, the mobile operators. Uh, for, L for LPWA, we might try to uh, collect data from uh, these operators, although there might be some issues. We'll see that uh, uh, later. And then there's a short range applications. And here we cannot rely on supply side uh, data because it's simply not available. We have to uh, rely on alternative data sources, uh, things like device vendors, the internet as data source, user surveys, or machine generated data as we have seen in the previous applications, in the previous presentations, sorry. Now, I will uh, show some examples of uh, these new uh, indicators and uh, data sources later on. But before that, we should look at what kind of indicators we should collect and what are the challenges associated with uh, collecting these indicators. Uh, for cellular technologies, we will collect mostly M2M type indicators. We are already collecting M2M uh, type indicators, but the Internet of Things uh, will demand certain refinements for, for the existing indicators. For instance, it will probably make sense to split M2M by, by technology or network, because different networks will um, involve, will uh, supply different uh, applications. It will, it will probably also make sense to collect uh, M2M indicators for specific uh, applications like uh, connected cars or smart meters, depending on our uh, policy uh, needs. Then there, there are certain technological developments associated with the Internet of Things that will impact our indicators and that we must take into account. For instance, there's, the, there's eSIMs or simultaneous or multi-homing connectivity, meaning that certain devices will have the possibility to have one or two or even more uh, connections. And this will impact our indicators because the, it, it might lead to double counting. And so our definitions must be adapted to take this into account. And then there's the issue of mobile penetration. Uh, we must split person-to-person uh, -person mobile connections from machine-to-machine uh, -machine connections. Otherwise, we'll get 500% or 600% uh, mobile penetration, which is uh, meaningless. Then uh, for uh, LPWA uh, networks, we can collect number of devices, clients, traffic or revenues. Uh, the problem is some of these operators are transnational operators that are, are not based on our countries and that might uh, make it difficult to collect uh, the data. For the short range applications, uh, well, we can collect some people are collecting number of devices, type of devices, or type of applications. And uh, what you must take into account that is that this is all, 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 always going to be only a partial uh, subset of the, all of the universe of short-range applications. On the other hand, when we, when we use uh, surveys, user surveys, to uh, collect data on these applications, we must also take into account, for instance, that uh, consumers may not be aware that uh, they have the, these um, devices or, or uh, applications. It might be in, embedded on other services or devices. Now, this is uh, an example of LPA, LPWA service indicators collection. Uh, we at Anacom in Portugal collected data from LPWA providers. Who this involved determining which were these, these operators, but uh, th this was uh, sort of easy because of the licensing procedures. And we collected number of devices, clients, traffic and revenue, and uh, the conclusions were as expected that uh, there are a significant number of devices, a low volume of traffic per device, and low number of, of corporate clients. We have here an example of a consumer survey on connected cars. This was done by Ofcom, they asked uh, consumers, uh, what were the types of devices and services that they had on their cars, for instance, uh, automated driving features or in-built infotainment, so this is possible and feasible in that it's being done by, by some countries. Yesterday we heard from the OECD that they are planning to develop the, a model questionnaire 
on the, the IoT, so uh, this is clearly uh, a way to go. Then we have internet as, as data source uh, sources. For instance, uh, Shodan, which is a, a search engine, collects number of connections and location uh, of devices that are connected to the internet. So this is a, a new area that can be uh, explored on uh, to, to, to measure the internet of things. So in conclusion, uh, what I'm saying is we should continue to collect data on fixed and mobile coverage and develop 5G uh, coverage indicators. We should start computing our mobile penetration separating machines from people. Uh, we should try to refine our M2M indicators uh, and mobile indicators to take into account that uh, uh, it, it makes sense to split indicators by uh, network or technology. We might want to start collecting data on specific applications, and we must also investigate what are the effects of eSIMs or multi-homing on our existing indicators. And uh, we, sh we should clearly explore alternative data sources, LPWA providers, device vendors, retail outlets, internet sources, or machine-generated data, as was, as was mentioned before. And lastly, we must adapt our consumer or user surveys to, uh, to the IoT. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now we have uh, ended our uh, four speakers' uh, contribution on the uh, emerging technologies in, in ICT sectors. So we have only five minutes left for, for the uh, discussion. So uh, let me... Uh, give you a proposal that we can go back to our, uh, the topics of our, of our sessions. Uh, uh, in, we, I suggest that we can uh, have some, uh, we can have some uh, idea or comments or uh, questions on the speech of the uh, two, uh, four speakers. Uh, you can uh, evolve around the topics of what is the context giving rise to this emerging ICT trends. Are new digital divides arising from the uneven spread of the, these innovations worldwide? How can they be tracked? How can effectively evidence-based policies be designed to accelerate the adoption of these emerging trends and ensure that nobody is left behind? But you can also have uh, the other topics. So now the floor is open. We may have two or three uh, questions or comments from the delegates. Okay, you have the floor. C'est la délégation tunisienne. Merci, monsieur le modérateur. La transformation digitale de l'économie résultant de l'adoption de ces nouvelles technologies est au cœur de l'ignée d'action du SMSI, notamment le C1, C2, C3 et C5. Nous pensons qu'afin de mener à bien cette transformation, il est primordial de prévoir une infrastructure accessible à tous avec des plateformes technologiques adaptées au profil de chaque pays assurant accessibilité et sécurité. Aussi, des compétences adaptées et une révision du cadre réglementaire. Conscient du rôle de ces technologies dans le développement de la société de l'information, la Tunisie invite l'UIT à lancer une réflexion sur l'adoption des indicateurs mesurant leur impact sur la société avec toutes ses composantes. Monsieur le modérateur, du moment que j'ai la parole, permettez-moi de vous faire part rapidement des commentaires et des propositions qu'on souhaitait présenter hier et que le manque du temps ne nous a pas permis de faire au sujet du New Metrics for Broadband and Server Security. Nous invitons les pays membres à approfondir les discussions relatives à l'adoption des indicateurs relatifs aux utilities et nous suggérons d'adopter des indicateurs sur l'usage ainsi que le revenu de ces applications. Nous proposons en ce qui concerne la cybersécurité de prendre en considération les indicateurs fonctionnels et opérationnels tels que les indicateurs sur la protection de l'enfant en ligne, les indicateurs sur le e-confiance tels que les certificats électroniques et la sécurisation des tra transactions et les indicateurs sur les infrastructures critiques CIIP. Merci. Thank you, Therese. So do you have any feedback to, to, to her, Mixa? Okay, so any other comments or questions asking for flow? Okay, you have the floor. <coughs> uh, 
my question is actually to uh, Johannes Bauer. Uh, thing is that uh, his advice is about in the four um, components uh, around the digital transformation, the big data one is very important one. But what the underdeveloped countries are struggling with uh, initiating a big data project, uh, we are struggling around the uh, different data initiatives, how to analyze the big data and then how to capture them and how to visualize them for the policymakers. We are we have challenges around the expertise, we have uh, challenges around the technology and how to manage them because these things are very important uh, for the digital transformation. So what is your advice for the underdeveloped countries who are where we are struggling with the different data projects. We are creating lots of social media data and what we are using for decision making at the government level. And we have facilitating Facebooks uh, to use for the uh, government employees. Uh, what types of uh, anal discussion is there? What types of analysis is there? How decision is taking? And what types of visualization should come up from all those discussion? So what is your advice? Uh, around that. Thank you. So, I gave some feedback. <clears throat> well, let me answer briefly, which is very complicated. These are, these are both very, very um, big and very, very important questions. And I think we'll need much more discussion on those. Than I, and I cannot really capture the, the significance of, of, of these issues in, in a short statement. But to the first statement by, by the delegation from Tunisia, you are absolutely right. It is important to, to expand uh, what we consider relevant indicators to uh, capture also those effects on society, because that's really the, the metric or the, the effects on, on this uh, sustainable development goals. Because in the end, an indicator is only useful in relationship to a goal, to a purpose. And I think that needs to be really emphasized going forward. The second question from, from the delegation of Bangladesh, in the long run, the biggest challenge of big data is probably to make sense of big data, because it's much easier to harvest the data and visualize the data than to explain what is going on. And, and the, the capacity building that needs to happen is, is to develop um, a sufficient number of, of data scientists and people with mindsets that are sort of capable and, and interested in analyzing the underlying processes that are going on. Because we know much less how, right now about how to use big data for uh, prescriptive analysis and decision making than we do for, for, for other purposes. In that context, I think it will be important to emphasize open algorithms. So there's transparency as to how we make those decisions. What we do not want is sort of uh, pr proprietary algorithms that make decisions for us and we have no clue why this is happening. Okay, do you have any feedback to the question from Bangladesh? <laughs> Just a short uh, note on, on both of those questions to, to concur with, with Johannes basically, that I think what matters is how the effects of these technologies uh, uh, trickle down to permeate into the, the, the lives of people and the realities of businesses. And I guess that's also what I was trying to, to drive home in, in, in my talk, that. These technologies are not globally homogenous. Uh, you know, AI exists, doesn't, doesn't exist everywhere in the world in the same way. And so I think uh, much more work can be done to, with representative surveys maybe, with uh, you know, actually uh, engaging with, with the stakeholders on the ground. How do these technologies enter your lives or your business, business processes? Because often what we see in our research is that the effects are actually very marginal and realities are uh, dominated by other things or there is a lack of control over these trends. So these trends are kind of imposed from the outside um, but, but there is a lack of control. So I think this is where uh, the most work has to be done. How, how do these technologies impact the actual processes and the actual, actual business processes and the actual uh, lives of people? Okay, do you have any further comments to the questions? Do you? Yeah, maybe. Okay, because the time is very limited, so uh, I have to end our uh, discussion on the topics. So uh, uh, at the end, uh, please allow me to invite you to give our warm applause to the wonderful presentation and their 
answer to, to these uh, very hard topics. Thanks. So I have to hand back to the, uh, your majesty, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Mediator. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to, uh, to hear the, the analysis of the future and how to build uh, uh, this uh, uh, marriage between the, 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 the technology and life, technology and society, technology and business, technology and, uh, and uh, our family life and our uh, own behavior. So uh, good, uh, thank you very much for all the panelists and for, for all the, uh, the, the audience.